So welcome back to another edition of our Shattered Lives podcast. This is another Week in Crime episode uh, where we speak about the stories of the day. Um, and there's been quite a few this week. So uh, we, without further ado, I'll just introduce crime correspondent with the star, Michael O'Toole. Welcome back. Hello, Paul. How are you? Not too bad. Not too bad. We, we, uh, we were in the office today, Mick, so it's a bit surreal now that we're uh, meeting on zoom as it were uh after the fact <laughs> but yeah. we spent quite a bit of time in the office in talbot street today uh which we won't bore our listeners as to the details just a uh a mandatory meeting but it was surreal to be back in the office uh is all i'll say uh after nearly three years yeah i, I skipped a bit a wee bit early thank god but uh <laughs> I, I, I will, what i will say about the, these pods really interesting but whenever we're doing the, the the crime review of the week i'm always sitting there the night before going jesus what are we going to talk about and then i realize there's always plenty to talk about. There's always something so happening much. in crime. So I don't think we'll ever be short of topics to discuss in this review. Yeah, as you said, I think in the last pod that just there's so much going on that you nearly forget how much you've covered. But anyway, we'll 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 get into it a bit. I just want to briefly mention um, <clears throat> a story that we worked on last week, uh, with the, the case of Simone Lee. Uh, she was a victim of horif- horrific assault uh, and Christopher Stokes. Uh, the man who uh, very viciously assaulted her and, and doused her with ammonia acid and hot water. He was jailed for 11 and a half years. But um, I then discovered on Sunday um, that the, the the person who originally attacked her, so this was the second time in her life that she was viciously assaulted. So it, very unusual, as I mentioned in the previous part. I won't labour on about it, but she had been assaulted in a previous incident in 2016 where she'd also been doused with boiling hot water and left with uh, with a brain injury and very seriously assaulted. And that attacker received a nine and a half year sentence with two suspended. Uh, so he did seven and a half, well, had a seven and a half year prison sentence. He was, he was on remand since 2016 and he walked free uh, in November there. Um, so that's something that she only recently learned of and she was she was quite shocked. I mean, she she understands the system quite well now, but uh, even still, she was she was in a state of shock um, that this individual uh, has now been released and that he's back on the streets and that he's around in the Limerick area. And she's afraid of the, the possibility, the very real possibility of bumping into him in the street. But I think it's worth discussing because I think we touched on it a little bit in the previous pod, Mick, in, in that there's remission. Uh, standard remission all these sentences so he's walked free in, in in a little under six years despite a headline sentence of nine and a half you know so i mean it's just the system that we have it's quite shocking you know yeah and that's 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 what i was talking about last week you know journalists uh, and court reporters will always give the headline what we'll call, we'll call it the headline sentence so nine years but one thing i try to do is to, to contextualize it so as you say you know He's entitled to 25% remission. Now that's standard. It's not, people always think it's remission for good behaviour, but it's not. It's standard remission. Now there is an enhanced remission of 33%. I think you have to apply for that and you have to be of really, really good behaviour. And there are certain categories who who don't get it. I don't think, for example, that a sex offender has ever got enhanced remission. So they always just get the minimum, which is 25%. But you can, you know, rather than for good, Behavior. You can have some of your remission shaved off for bad behaviour, but you're really only talking, I think, two weeks at a time, you know, that sort of thing. So, look, you know, when, when you were telling me there, 2016, seven and a half years, it, it is, I mean, he didn't get out early. By no means he got out early. He, that man did his time. That's just the way the system is. Because as well as remission, it's also backdated. And did, you mentioned he had been in custody on remand since 2016. So, Sentences are usually backdated until when to they when go into prison. Remand. Now, I have seen some cases where the sentence, even though people have been in remand, I have seen cases where the the, the sentence starts on the day of the conviction or on the day of the sentencing. That does happen. I think the judges have the power to do that, but it's usually backdated. Yeah, I, I, I suppose, look, it's just worth mentioning and, and given context of that, is, uh, as you have brilliantly done there, um, I can't really add to it just because people might be wondering how is he out already? Well, the, the truth is, as you've said, he served his sentence when you take in, uh, into consideration all those other things. But let's move on because we have a lot to talk about. Um, we're going to talk about Enoch Burke and uh, other members of his family. Uh, it's hard not to. Uh, it's hard not to avoid this subject. To be honest, uh, and, and I'll say this from the outset, 
neither myself uh, nor yourself, Mick, although correct me, uh, have, have really covered this story in, in any capacity, really. We've been following it like everybody else. Uh, obviously, we have colleagues that have worked on it. Um, and, and, you know, uh, we're forced to kind of follow it, uh, whether we like it or not, um, it be, because it's just a never-ending saga. But uh, I know people are mostly familiar with the facts of the case, but just to briefly remind them that Enoch Burke was a, was a, a teacher at at uh, Wilson's Hospital School in, in, in Multi Farnham there in County Westmead. Um and there was an issue basically where a a a, a student in the school uh wished to identify a particular way and the school principal had made it known to staff in the school uh, that this child uh, was transitioning and that 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 they wished to use the pronouns they and Mr Burke uh launched an objection to this and made an issue of this at a religious event uh, in connection to the school and at a, 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 a dinner event as well, I believe. Um, and as a result of that dispute, uh, he was uh, effectively uh, put on leave. He challenged all of this. It ended up in the courts, as people know. Uh, and, and, and ultimately, he was ordered to stay away from the school. Uh, and now when he was in the Court of Appeal yesterday, he was challenging injunctions that had been put out by uh, against him uh, by the high court telling him, ordering him to stay away from the school and as people already are aware uh, mr burke has not stayed away from the school and he has repeatedly gone there every day and in fact i believe he was there again today he was um and he's charged 700 euro for each and every occasion where he stands outside the school um but utter chaotic scenes in the court of appeal yesterday uh, where Mr. Burke and members of his family uh, were challenging these injunctions and they lost their case. And uh, members of his family launched into a, um, I suppose there's no other way to put it, the uh, uh, irate objection to it. Uh, and, and individuals had to be forcibly removed from the building. And you saw, uh, most people now have seen the footage uh, of people being dragged out of the building and i i've i i've never seen anything like it i and, and you're a long time in the game Mick. i don't know whether you've seen people being physically manhandled i mean physically having to be dragged uh, by the heels out of a building out of a court dragged is the right word so a couple of points why you and i haven't been covering this it's not a criminal issue it's mm. a civil issue even when enoch burke went to jail that's civil contempt mm. so it's it's not a crime beat for us and also, I know. Oh, you, I forgot to mention that he went to jail. Sorry, yeah, yeah it's it's got there's so much to it. Yeah, he went to jail at one point. Yeah. Exactly, and and you know another point. Yeah. We're not going to get into the rights and wrongs of this massive issue, but the the court of appeal, Mr. Justice uh, Birmingham, was quite clear in his findings yesterday that this whole issue was not about transgenderism; it was about how he reacted. So they're separate issues. I know that's a it's a it's a minefield, and. I'd be afraid to go into it, but the judge was clear. It's not about transgenderism, it's about him and how he interacted with the courts and that sort of thing. But yes, look, I, I, I was, I, I've covered, I've, I'm in my, nearly in my fourth decade of, of journalism now, and I've never seen anything like that. Even in really, really tough, hard bitten crime cases or, you know, criminal trials, I don't think I've ever, ever seen any activity like that. I've I've seen, you know, people given out a wee bit in court. I've seen plenty of aggro outside court. There have been a number of high profile cases, even in, in say in the last two, 20 years even, uh, where there have been classic angry mob outside courts. And I think you were probably at one last year. I won't say which one it is because it's subjudice. But when a person was charged, there was a significant uh, crowd outside. I can remember uh, Robert Holland, the death of Robert Holland in Cork in 2002. There was a very angry crowd at that when uh, the man was charged. Uh, so people do get angry and people go to courts and they're and you see them in England an awful lot in child killings and alleged child killings. There are, I'm not going to say mob, I'm going to say crowd. People do get very angry and very head up. But I've always found that people are usually and largely quite respectful of the legal system. Like, I, don't, it, I mean, I was talking to you last night about this, Paul. It always amazes me. And every time I go into the, the CCJ where all the major criminal trials happen, I always wonder how come, you know, no loved one of a, a child who's been murdered or a, a per, an adult who's been murdered, you know, say when there's a conviction, they usually give Reed 
victim impact statements and that usually involves someone walking up to the witness stand and walking directly past the dock where the convicted killer is and it always amazes me how the, the restraint of Irish people and the dignity of Irish people because the, the temptation to clock the killer and to get stuck into the killer and to beat the killer up must be huge and I've never seen it and I've always seen loved ones going up to the, the witness stand with the ult, utmost dignity and the way they you know cur- cur- comport themselves and the way they behave so I've never seen anything like this now I have noticed in the last couple of years especially around again it's a civil matter the issue of you know home repossessions and that sort of stuff there are some activists who go into court and you see them doing things like filming and shouting at the judge and confronting the judge and we've had people picketing judges houses well especially over in the west so that, that you know but this is completely off the scale i mean reading you know some of the court reporters live tweets enoch burke was holding on to the the pew of the court and they had the manhandled him out of the court and we saw Simeon Burke I know he's charged with the public order issue you know Simeon being carried like four guards carrying him out and he was going how dare you how dare you so you know it was bizarre it was surreal in one way but at the same time it just goes to show you that the respect in which the court system usually is held because I think this is an outlier although there have been some instances where people have I think you know have uh, shouted at judges and that sort of stuff I don't think this is a new trend. I just think this is a complete outlier and it's a it's a bizarre case. The whole thing is bizarre and and look I'll be careful what I what I'm saying here just I I I don't want to yeah as, as there's an individual now before the courts um you mentioned Simeon Burke there um but just generally and I wonder what your opinion is on this how do you feel about covering a story like this and I uh, rather I'll phrase it a better way about giving a subject like this this level of media uh, coverage like as i said mr enoch burke was was outside the school again today uh I, I that's at least 10 times where media have attended the school to basically give coverage and and uh, point out that he is again outside the school at what point i suppose are we serving um i don't know what enoch burke's purposes are but at, at what point are we just giving it unnecessary um attention um and and turning it into a, a media circus i mean that's what i've wor- worried about about this story it's only it's only because of the circus that they uh they they brought into the court yesterday that it got uh, obviously un- another unprecedented level of media attention but at what point i suppose do we do we say okay right this is something that we're giving too much attention to i'm just curious about what you think it's 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 an extremely difficult question um i personally my view is that as long as he's there, we should be there because I think there is, it's of interest to the public and I think there is also a public interest in this. Now, you may you may disagree, other people may disagree and I know, I mean, I was reading Twitter last week and people were saying, the minute the media stop going to the school, Enoch Burke will stop going to the school. I think that's nonsense. I think Enoch Burke, you know, say what you want. I personally think that Enoch Burke will stay there as long as he feels he has to. I don't think He's particularly interested in how the media, in that isolated incident, whether they're there or not. I think if the media weren't there, he would still be there. But it is, it's, it's, it's almost, it's almost a chicken and an egg question. And, and there's, there's another example, right? I've been interested in some far right, but there are others who aren't far right, who are anti-vaxxers, who have, you know, been taken to the streets in a whole rake of issues. Now, do we report about them or do we ignore them? I know some newspaper executives around Ireland have taken the opinion we're going to ignore them. My own view is I thought we should be confronting them earlier and reporting about them earlier. But you know what? Who's right and who's wrong? There's a justification. If uh, well, that this is my view. I'm only giving my personal view. But if there if there is a justification for covering the story, as in it's newsworthy, yeah. But I I I, I do. I did wonder, I'll just, again, I'm only giving my own personal opinion. I did wonder maybe the fourth or fifth day that he showed up at the school, I was like, right, like, why are there cameras there? Uh, at, at what point do you do you sort of say, right, this is unnecessary coverage? However, what happened in the courts yesterday, of course, can't ignore that. It was an absolute circus. And of course, it's a, a cracking story and it deserved to be on the front page of the papers because it, it was an extraordinary event. But I just think, 
yeah, uh, like, uh, are we then, as a result of that, going to follow him to the school for the next week? I don't know. And I'm, I might well be asked to do that, but I, uh, my own personal opinion is uh, it has to be newsworthy. It, we can't just keep following the same uh, thing every single day. Uh, and, you know, I, that's just my view. My own view is this has Paul Healy written over, all over it. This is a, <laughs> a perfect event, vehicle for a Healy yeah, doorstep. Yeah. Watch so, me, watch me go down there tomorrow. Now, yeah. I, I, I think you're going to have to. Healy. No, look, look I, you see, I, and, and God, this is this is ter- this sounds like a, a discussion that media academics can have. I don't like us mediating what people should know. Right, the, the story is there. We can't ignore it. And I know you don't. I mean, you know, you're not saying ignore it, but it, he would be there if we weren't. Right, and I think it's newsworthy, and I think, look. Maybe sometimes, you know, RT and all of us will go, right, enough's enough. But I don't think we're anywhere near that stage. I think it's still, there's still a significant amount of interest in this, public and other sorts of interest in this. And, you know, remember, not every story has to be public interest. It can be of interest to the public and I make no apologies for that. Anyway, I think we disagree, but that's good. We'll leave that debate for another day. Uh, We'll move on because I I think it's worth uh, mentioning another matter now that is before the special criminal court um, and that is the case of Brendan Trainer and Jimmy Flynn so as our listeners uh, might be aware anyone that has been listening to us for the last uh, couple of weeks obviously we were covering the trial of Jerry Hutch and that was before the special criminal court now this is the first uh, other high profile case to take place in the special criminal court and it surrounds the uh, the robbery incident at the Lordship Credit Union, um, w- which was two thousand and thirteen. Am I right? It, it was. It was January the twenty fifth, twenty thirteen. Now th- that was the incident in which Detective Guardy Adrian Donahue was shot dead. Now a man called Aaron Brady. In tw- it also, I think it was twenty twenty. Man called Aaron Brady was tried for the capital murder of Detective Guardy Donahue. He was convicted. He was jailed for 40 years. He was also jailed for 14 years for the armed robbery of the Lordship Credit Union at Belurgan, where Detective Garda, where and when Detective Garda Donahue was shot dead. And he got 14 years for that. So these two men, Jimmy Flynn and Benny Trainer, are both charged with the robbery of €7,000 at the Lordship Credit Union in, Bel- in Belurgan in County Louth between Dundalk and Carlingford on the 25th of January 2013. That was the incident in which Detective Garda Adrian Donahue was shot dead. Neither man is charged with that murder. However, uh, another man, Aaron Brady, went on trial last year for the capital murder of Detective Garda Donahue. He was convicted of that and he got 40 years for the capital murder and 14 years for the armed robbery. Now, significantly, that was in the non, it was in the jury, normal jury courts. These cases have been moved to the non-jury special criminal court, which we, we all know. So the state claims that both men conspired with Aaron Brady to carry out a series of burglaries in counties Louth, Cavan, Meath, Monan, around the time. And they tried to get the, they're also charged with the attempted robbery, or the robbery of the credit union. They tried, At the start of the trial, they tried to get the trial, two charges separated, so one for conspiracy and one for armed robbery, but they failed. Case is largely circumstantial. The case is going on going ahead, largely under the radar. It's not getting the attention that the Hutch trial did. However, there was some significant evidence on Tuesday, and Paul's going to talk us through that. Yeah, and look, we do want to give it the attention it deserves. We obviously can't sit there every day like we did with the Hutch trial, but we we will we will follow it with interest. Um, obviously, it's a high profile case, but yeah, just some of the evidence um that was heard at uh, on Tuesday um <laughs> was 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 pretty incredible, and it it amounts to uh, what what the state says is a pictorial admission uh of involvement in in the robbery uh on on behalf of the accused man uh. Sorry, not on behalf of. Again, this is the evidence against Brendan Trainer, and supposedly there is a um, a tattoo on his upper back, and it was photographed by the guards uh, in April two thousand and twenty one, and it was shown on the screens uh, in the court on Tuesday. And leading the court through this was a, a very familiar name that is Brendan Gretton, uh, uh, eminent senior counsel, uh, who. Uh, listeners may remember is defending Jerry Hutch in his trial well he is now acting for the director of public prosecutions so the prosecution side in this particular case and, and it's worth discussing that we mentioned this before Mick didn't we that look uh, the barristers can can 
swap sides, so to speak, in terms of, the, I mean, on uh, one case they can represent the defence, in one case they are uh, representing the prosecution, and, and certainly Brendan Gretton uh, is, 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 is one barrister who does that uh, quite regularly. It's one of my favourite, one of the favourite things that I have, my favourite parts of the Irish legal system. I think there's a great honour in that. It's called the taxi rank system. So it's, you know, solicitors can decide to take on a client, but largely barristers, taxi rank, the next one up. So Brendan Gretton is a fantastic barrister. You saw him going after Jonathan Dowdall. I mean, I would not like to be up against him. So in a lot of countries, say particularly England and stuff, you, you, you either, you know, you can be a prosecution or defence barrister. But here you can do both. And I just think it's absolutely fantastic for our system that one one day Mr. Grandin can be defending Jerry Hutch with every ounce of his brain. And then the next he's prosecuting these two men and he'll use he'll be just as he'll be just as, you know, strong for the defence as he will be for the prosecution. He will really, really go for it. And I just think that's remarkable. And I think it's something I think we should be very proud of that we have this system. Shows you also. Uh, sorry, I know I'm going off the beaten drag of, of talking about the case here, but just it also shows you the the just how busy uh, these legal um, uh, uh, these legal experts are. The these eminent barristers are um, in the case of. Uh, Sean Gillan, uh, he he was actually prosecuting in the Simone Lee case uh, that I that I was speaking about at the start of the pod. There, he was the prosecution counsel in that down in Cork. So uh, he was he was prosecuting in the Jerry Hutch trial. So it just shows you how busy they are. But anyway, just going back to the case, uh, Brendan Gretton was was uh, speaking on Tuesday um, about about this tattoo, um, and and the tattoo depicts four males wearing hats. Uh, includes one of them holding a long barreled firearm and a woman wearing a balaclava with a gun to her lips, um, a large BMW car, a pistol, rounds of ammunition and wads of money. And the state is saying that this is, uh, in effect, uh, a pictorial admission of, uh, of his activities, Mr. Trainer's activities. Um, it, it, as I said, it was shown on the screen in, in the courtroom uh, and... and uh, it, it, it basically the court was going through in detail this particular tattoo and the individuals in it um so uh, it's extraordinary it's it, there's, a, there's a part on the the registration plate of the bmw car on the tattoo which says boss bft um and mr gretton told the court um that that had heard evidence that uh, mr trainer ha- had given a statement uh where his name brenda brendan thomas trainer are, are the that may uh, that's that's his name and, and and basically making the case that that those letters bft um may refer to uh, people's surnames including his own so it, it, it's going to be an interesting trial uh we weren't there that day but we will we'll try to call into it if we can um uh, do, you, do you have any idea how long it's going to last make how long that trial it, will go? It, yeah it's it, i'm told i think from the paperwork it's going to be six months so that is one hell of a trial so look, I, you know, we just wouldn't have the logistics to be there every day, but we'll keep an eye on it because it is, it is interesting, and we obviously have a wee bit more leeway because it is the special and there's there's no jury. Yes, and then moving on to a development which happened today, uh, which uh, in relation to Lisa Smith, uh, Lisa Smith, who was was charged and and, and found guilty of membership of, uh, of of ISIS, and and she is serving a prison sentence. She. Uh, challenged that in the Court of Appeal and the result was today and she has lost that. You, you were following a bit of that today, Mick. Well, yeah, look, the judges obviously, she she, 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 she thought the sentence, or the, she, she made an application that the sentence was too long. So the judges in the Court of Criminal Appeal have rejected that. But just go back to the point, she got 15 months. Yeah. So, Sorry, you should state, she's not, you're, you're right, she's not appealing her conviction, she was appealing uh, the severity of her sentence, yes. So, 15 months, three quarters of that is, uh, you can work that out. That's, it's, it's, it's about a year, isn't it, really? So, you know, I'd say she'd be out soon enough, no matter what, because she has been in custody for a while anyway. Yeah, and I just, it was the first case of its kind, wasn't it? It was an extraordinary case. It kind of, I think, uh, it, it was something that hit headlines nearly every single day, and then it, it kind of went out of uh, the news for such a time that we nearly, when it ended up... Uh, Back in the courts, we we we'd nearly forgotten about it to a degree, but it was an extraordinary case, uh, and and Miss Smith hasn't shied away from the media. She's spoken several times, uh, and and appears to now be stating that she'd made some mistakes and that she got involved with the wrong people. But she she has an extraordinary story, uh, again one that we'll 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 continue to follow with interest. 
Mick, uh, you were down uh, on the West Coast um, at the start of this week for a, a highly unusual case. Now, we have to be careful because an individual is now charged um, in relation to it. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let you speak about uh, the, this this extraordinary um, case. And, and you're, you're right. I'm, I'm going to be very, very careful. All I can say is there's a man called John Brogan, who is an 83-year-old, who was found with gunshot wounds in his house at Pheasant Hill, which is just outside Castle Bar in County Mayo. Now, that was on Sunday evening. A man was subsequently arrested on Sunday, and on Tuesday, that man appeared in court and has been charged with murder. Now, he's been remanded in custody. And just one thing people may be interested in, uh, people charged with murder at the district court, which is where you make your first appearance, cannot apply for bail. The High Court is the only court that can grant bail in a murder case. So if the accused man wishes to go for bail, he'll have to go to the High Court. But it just it just got me thinking. One of the one of the, the things that I do, and it's it's a sad part of being a, a crime journalist, is every year on the first of January I set up a database uh, for homicide that will take place that year and I fill it in every time there's a a, a killing or, or a violent death. So so far this year that now I because I'm a 32 county man, I do it on an all Ireland basis. So I do it every year in the Star and the Mirror, and it's up north as well. So that's why I do 32 counties. So so far this year, um, there have been two fatal shootings in the whole of Ireland. Last year there were ten. There were seven in the Republic and three in the North. So there were 68 homicides or violent deaths in the whole of the island in in last year I think we're, we're on about one two about eight so far this year anyway so some years are better than others the worst year in the last maybe decade was 2016 when 21 people in the Republic and in the North were shot dead 15 in the South and 16 up north but that was the year of the Kin and Hutch feud that it really exploded so that uh, explained the the, the the spike in it but say 2000, uh, 2021 there were seven fatal shootings three in the in the north and four in the republic last year as I say there were seven here in the republic three in the north so that's ten in 2020 there were seven three in the republic and four in the north so you know and then now in 2019 there were 16 that was the first time it was double figures that was 11 here and 5 up north so there is there's no doubt that there's a downward trend in gun crime it's, it was very bad in 2016 but it has gone down significantly so you know say 15 so the the, the worst year that I can see now this is just for the Republic because the, the PS and I have different stats they do them sort of from April to April whereas the guards have it from December to January but the, the worst year that I can go back to was in 2006 when there were 26 gun killings in the Republic alone so that's almost four times the number that there were last in 2022 so look you know gun crime is down and one of the the stats that I, I that I, I found very interesting last year I was examining gun homicides in the Republic and in 2021 it was something like 31 and it was the lowest that I could find is going back to 1975. I think it was 22, actually. I think it was around 22. And that was a really, really new number. Now, that may be connected to um, COVID and stuff. And I noticed that there were 44 homicides last year recorded by the Guardi. In my own tally, which I do by myself, I don't have the official figures, I counted 43. So I, I, I wasn't doing too bad. I was, I was one off the official figure. Now, that was up 76% on 2021. And one reason for that would be that in 2021 there were still the effects of the lockdown. But it's just interesting. Gun crime has reduced significantly in the last few years. And look, there have been two people uh, died in shooting incidents in the whole of, the, of, of Ireland this year. So I'd say unless something terrible happens, we're probably on course to have around the same number as 2022. And the, the, the trends are down. I suppose that's good news because I mean you, you hear nothing about uh, you hear nothing but a, a rise in crime. I suppose there's an awful lot of knife crime out there, and I mean I, I was doing a story today um, in relation to uh, 
uh, incidents of violence in the city in Dublin city centre and 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 just this is anecdotally really and not statistically but uh, I, I'm speaking to business owners who are saying it's rampant now and they're dealing with uh, incidents of violence on a daily basis uh, and we have some cctv footage of an incident there just two weeks ago in the temple bar area where it just appears to be a totally random assault very serious assault so um the level of violence uh, at least anecdotally in the city of dublin uh, se- seems to be on the increase post covid which maybe we can discuss again in, in greater detail in another pod but it's different to homicides but the, the, there does seem to be an, another level of violence out there yeah and another serious issue is domestic violence Domestic violence exploded during lockdown. I think it went up 25% because women and children were effectively trapped in homes with their partners because of the lockdowns. It was really bad. But I just I just have the, the stats here. There's there, there have been 10 deaths so far north and south this year, two in the Republic, in the north, eight down here. But what's interesting, I'll, several of those cases have not been classified as homicides yet. Uh, and I can't really go into them because people are before the courts, but in I'll tell you how many. One, two, three. In four of the deaths that I have, uh, people have been charged with non-fatal offences, so they haven't been charged with manslaughter or or murder. So we we can't classify them at the, at the end of the year. Now there may be charges coming, but at the minute, four of those cases are not technically regarded as homicides, although people have died as a result of, of various incidents. But there may be developments in each of those cases, but I won't go into them as it's subjudice. But I just, thought, I just thought it's interesting, particularly about gun crime. You know, people do think that it's out of control. Gun crime is down. Homicides, they're up on 2021, but they're not up on, 20, on 2019, for example. So, you know, every every death is it is it is a disaster, but it is, it is, it is reducing as is as gun crime. But as you say, violent crime, we'll have to we'll have to examine that. And it's especially the, the real scourge of domestic violence. It's really shocking how bad it has been in the last couple of years. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think it's worth discussing even just again, we're tied up with it when there's individuals before the courts, but it it'd be worth discussing in greater detail just the the types of crimes that are being committed. I mean, I certainly find in the last maybe two, three years that um been covering more and more I would what you would say are unusual cases um just just outliers like just you know a, a random so, something that might be entirely random or in in nature or uh, as I said it's just unusual uh, um there, there was uh I'm trying to be <laughs> there's an individual charge in relation to an incident that happened in Tala last year which which was an unusual um incident um I mean it just just there just seems to be I don't know if you've noticed um, uh, an an increase in those type of outliers, those unusual uh, crimes, that those kind of once in a year type crimes, and I, I, there were two or three of them last year. It was just an unusual number of 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 bizarre crimes. Yeah, and I know that you're we're, we're hyping about what we can say, but I will say one in one in one interest. Something that interests me is now this is speaking generally. I'm not talking about any current cases. I remember years ago I was talking to a senior guard and. No, he he gave me a figure for the number of killings that year. No, it was quite bad. It was, it was something like sixty five, right? No, it was a long, long time ago, maybe fifteen years ago. And he said, in every case, the guards try to establish a link between the suspect and the victim. Now that could be, you know, that Paul Healy was shot because Mick O'Toole he owed Mick O'Toole a, a, a drug debt, and Mick O'Toole got somebody to kill him. That's a link. There were two cases. They could have the sixty-five killings. There were two cases that were complete stranger murders, two out of sixty-five, and they were both women walking home, random. But in every other case, they could say, "Well, this person was killed because, say, the husband killed the wife, or he was killed because of a drugs debt, or he had had a row with this fella a couple of hours earlier." There were two complete random, and they were both sex crimes of women walking home. But it shows you how rare stranger murders are. But, but how how tragic they are as well. But look, that's something I, I, I the more I get into journalism, the more I'm getting into statistics because they do tell their own stories. So maybe in a few months we can do something about crime stats because I, I find them really, really interesting. Yes, I think we'll leave it there anyway. Thought that, that's great. Um we yeah, we've we've lots of interesting interviews to come, uh which we'll hope to uh, release when when we can uh when, when we've done them but we, we've we've got some good stuff lined up uh so thanks for listening and uh we'll be back to you as 
with the next pod hopefully in the next coming uh, coming days yeah thanks very much Paul and I really enjoy it and we we, we do know that there, is, there are increasing numbers of people listening we're going to keep going so thanks for listening everybody <laughs>